Beer Talk. Gespräche über und beim Bier. Hello and welcome to another episode of our podcast Beer Talk. Today I'm still traveling in Denmark and I'm on the maybe farthest north point of Denmark in Skagen. And I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, but we will know it in a second because my friend Christian Andersen is here. He's a journalist, a beer writer, wrote a lot of books about beer, a famous book about Pilsner. And I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me here. And my maybe pleasure. first introduce yourself a little bit to our listeners. I'll try. Um, a skilled journalist, skilled communications consult consultant. Um, I've been fascinated by beer for almost 20 years, communicating about beers for 20 years for Danish uh, news, uh, the news media. I'm a blogger. I'm an author. Uh, I make tastings. I'm, my life is beer. <laughs> Do you remember your first beer? Uh, yes, somehow I remember my first beer. <laughs> um A brewer once told me, um, an American brewer, that there was a tradition uh, when a newborn was uh, born in this uh, brewing family. They took uh, a finger in the in the beer and they put it yes. um, past the lips of the newborn. That far away I can't remember. Hmm. I hope that my parents did that, but I'm not from a brewer family, so probably not. I was a teenager, and uh, the only beers you could have in Denmark was Carlsberg Pilsner and Tuborg Pilsner. Um, there was practically only Pilsners at the market in the 70s. But another brewery called Hancock from the northern part of Jutland, uh, part of Denmark called Jutland, close to where we are now in Skagen, 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 mm. uh, the northernmost Uh, part of Denmark. This um, Hancock breweries uh, also exist today and they make excellent lagers and their f um, speciality is uh, German lagers and Czech lagers and uh, this lager I uh, remember as my first big beer experience was a Hancock lager uh, with SARS hops mm. and perhaps the The most important things about this experience was not the taste. It was the size of the bottle. It was 75 point, um, uh, what do you call it, centiliters. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, teenager, perhaps 13 years old, 75 centiliters, and not drinking Carlsberg, not drinking tuba, that was a thing. That was coolness at that time. Wow. So you shared that with your friends, and so you came... <laughs> into beer and you just said a german pilsner and a czech pilsner would you say today there is a danish pilsner when i wrote my first column as a blogger at the newspaper uh, Jyllands Posten, uh, at that time the biggest newspaper in denmark i had to make you know an entrance that would so people would, re would read my blog called durst <laughs> thirst um, and in Durst, my first uh, blog in Durst, uh, the headline was, there's no such thing as a Danish beer. Well, is it, do, that's a statement. That's a statement, isn't yes. it? Yes. And um, actually, still today, 20 years uh, after my first blog uh, at Durst, I don't think, but correct me if I'm wrong, and probably I'm wrong, Marcus, There's no, still no thing as a Danish beer. Um, and indeed, uh, no Pilsner beer. I wrote a book uh, called The Naked Beer, uh, a base book about Pilsner, 375 pages of about Pilsner. Uh, research uh, travels to Franconia, Bavaria, and in the Czech Republic, and Portland, or, oh, sorry, Oregon mm. in um in the United States, three rich um, Pilsner regions in, of the world. Talk to brewmasters, say to several uh, hundreds of Pilsners. Um, and I came uh, to my conclusion there's lots of Pilsner styles. Uh, no Danish styles, but lots of Pilsner styles. As you probably know, Marcus of all, uh, North uh, German Pilsner, 
um, best known of the Jever Pilsner. Not that good anymore, I think, but uh, we can take that, uh, talk about that if you dare. If you dare. We can. <laughs> we, we are an, an open podcast. We can talk about that. And if you would have asked me maybe five or six years ago, you would a, work on, a work on that book would be like a nightmare for me because yeah. I never drank Pilsner. I never liked mm -hmm. the style. And of course, I can judge it. And nowadays, sometimes I also drink it. Yeah. But it's still, for me, not a go-to beer. But yeah. of course, I, I know there are people who love it. And I, it's it's okay. <laughs> it's great. But not personally, let's say. that is. But we can, of course, talk about yeah. it and your impressions if you want. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> the book is my love of what I call a base beer, a pilsner. I call it a base beer. There's a reason why it's still uh, so popular. I know the, indus the un industry taste, the industry flavor is, is very uninteresting. But there is a reason why this Urquell, they invented it in 1842. There's a reason that it's still very popular um, so many years afterwards, I think. Uh, marketing, of course, but also the flavor. But in the beer re revolution, that was a no-go uh, type of beer. In Denmark, actually, uh, it was a hated beer style. Mikella, the Mikella brand, um, as you probably know, uh, they had a f famous, uh, he established a very famous beer bar in Copenhagen in, in 20... Ten, I think something like that. Yeah. Yes, mm. uh, called Mikela Beer Bar, and it was a, not only a sensation here in Copenhagen, not in, only in Denmark, but also in the beer craft beer world. Uh, if you want to enter their Wi-Fi, you had to have a code, and the code was "I hate Carlsberg." Oh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I don't hate Carlsberg. I don't hate Pilsner. I don't even hate industry Pilsner, I think. I'm not that sure about mm. that point. But I love the base beer Pilsner. And I knew because of my travels, not at least because of my travels to Germany, not at least because of my travels to Bavaria, that Pilsner is a drink for the gods. But it was taboo talking about Pilsner at that time. Um, but my love for Pilsner just grew over the years. And I'm a journalist and I know when I see a good story and the good story was here, make a book Christian and make it, uh, make the Pilsner have a revival. Uh, because my book is, of course, my love of Pilsner, but it's also a popular relation act. <laughs> yeah. Great. Come back for the Pilsner, Great. please. And the book will be published in English soon. It so to we October. Will we will, yes, we will also come back to our listeners then and, and say, okay, now it's available. <laughs> so you will hear from Please. us. Yes, we do. And, and I already have it in Danish, so I could more or less only look at the pictures, but this is also already very nice. But we also talked a lot, and, and I think it's, it's very good to have that, that Pilsner has such an advocate in the beer world like you. And in terms of hating, I would say a real beer lover should not say, I hate a beer or a beer style. You can maybe hate the behave of an actual company owner or these things, when, because we have that in Germany from some big industrial companies yeah. who try to destroy local beer culture mm. just to get some more hectoliters. Mm. But that's stopped now almost. And I think, and, and, and all the rest, it's beer. And I'm always happy if people drink beer, then they drink, let's say, Coke or something like that. So, and, and, and we all have this beer where we come back after a long trip, whatever, and that's more or less normally an easy beer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, industrial prisoners can be these easy beers, maybe not for enjoying and have all the flavor and aroma, but just for a refreshing drink. And especially if you have been like me, wandering uh, or hiking through the desert and coming back two weeks later, and then something like a McDonald's was like heaven, <laughs> just because you're back to to yeah. a normal thing. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that that's totally okay. And and I, really, I think it's important to have this this Pilsner culture in in a very deep look. Yeah. And for me, I would say it's a really good crisp 
Pilsner, it represents the all what hop can do. Mm. So the bitterness, but also the flavor, the freshness mm. of the yeast, the clearness of the beer, the clearness. and it's 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 so fantastic. And yeah. of course, yeah. that wise, a good Pilsner mm. is a fantastic beer. Yeah. Right? I'm with you totally. There's a reason why I call it the naked beer. It's because of faults and and uh, mistakes for for the brews. They can be you can taste it right away. Mm. And uh, when I made the book, uh, it was in love of the taste, and I was only uh, happy, more than happy to know, know when I talked to a skilled and uh, renewed bro brewmasters, they say the most difficult beer to make is the Pilsner, because it's a naked beer. You can always see see the faults, or of course, taste the faults. Yeah. Uh, I had it, uh, one of my uh, people in the book, Charlie Bamford, um, the Purple Foam. The, uh, yeah, yeah. The foam, yeah. This is his, uh, what is it called? His <laughs> nickname. His nickname is yeah. Popa Foam. Uh, he's renewed, uh, I think, in the beer business. Indeed. He say that when I get to a new brewery, the first beer I taste is a Pilsner, because if it's good, I know it's a good brewery. So these things just underlined that um, I had something good going on. And um, if we take a look at the beer revolution, it is a travel from uh, extreme beers and crazy beers to perhaps perhaps travel to the base beer now, to the more with um, underplayed flavors, mm. um, the alcohol level uh, more uh, simple and, and fine, like the Pilsner. Like the Czech, uh, the Czech Pilsner called at a Vyshipny, the 4.2, mm. 4.2. Yeah. Session Pilsners, um, this is, uh, this is uh, a thing. This, this will be a thing in, in the future. Yeah, maybe it's a bit also if you see the, the American craft beer revolution, they, they come from doing something different than Bud Light. <laughs> And mm. then they went to all these extremes in alcohol, in hops, in Yeah. sourness in salt whatever, whatever. Uh, and now they all come back to lager and yeah. and now they realize okay you can do all this crazy stuff but in the end yeah. you need to have a good clean well done yeah. beer and of course you can do it much more yeah. intense and aromatic like as Bud Light yeah. so there is now also good business in America yeah. and, and that's great and I think also here people are looking back to that beer style and especially in regions like, like Franconia where business were low in bitterness and almost like Helles or mm -hmm. something like, like that. Yeah. Now prisoners are also evolving mm -hmm. a bit and so I, th I think it's a, it's a very great thing and how about the reactions of the book in the Danish market? Did, what did, did they say? Did they say, think, okay, now he's promoting Carlsberg? Or no. What is, no. Uh, perhaps some some say that but um, it's my book it's an, uh, Jens Eiken's book uh, he's a skilled brewmaster Jens Eiken um, um, it, it is a bestseller in Denmark. Denmark is a little country, so <laughs> 4,000 copies. So That's still good. Still mm. good. Um, the reviews from the beer enthusiast was called uh, the Bible, Great. and the uh, reviews from the from the Library Foundation they called it uh, must have. So, I'm happy. Good. <laughs> Very great. Fantastic. So, <laughs> that, and I think for such a small country as you said, um, yeah. Uh, 4,000 is a lot of books, and so, great. Great. Um, let's look a little bit back to the past. So, you started a blog. Um, how was that? So, because in this time, it was it was not common to, to be so widespread on the internet with blogs. How did that came, and what did you do, and what was, how did the name come, and all these things? Durst was the name of the blog, is the name of the blog. Um, I'm a lover of German beer. I'm a lot of the German beer culture, uh, especially the beer culture of Fran uh, yeah, Franconia, Bavaria. Uh, I traveled there several times. Uh, I was at a, a course of uh, 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 project management, of my former job, and uh, we had to um, tell um, the teacher a success story. I'm not good at telling my own success stories. I'm What do we call it? Uh, I'm not good at that. Yeah. But I had to do it. So I told them that uh, my former wife, Susanne, 
and my two small children. We were traveling to uh, Bavaria three uh, summer holidays in a row. And that, uh, in spite that my former wife, Susanne, she has, she she was longing to go to Gran Canaria or some of the Spanish uh, holidays, but still three years in a row to uh, Bavaria for exploring the Bavarian uh, nature and um, mm. the culture and the beer, of course. Yeah, we are no longer married. Yeah, but she, <laughs> but she loved the beer too. So <laughs> She does. And we are good friends today. Mm. Um, I think that was a success story. Um, that's why I call it the Durst. Mm. And also I call it the Durst because I want to uh, tell everybody, please give a German beer uh, a chance. Because at that time in 2011, when it started, Durst, German beer was... Nobody in the craft beer world they drank uh, German beer. Yes, that is some. Yeah, th that brings us a little bit back to the beginning when we talked about is there a Danish beer? Yeah. Um, the listeners know because I mentioned it several times. But also when when I start the beer education, I also tell the people there is no German beer culture, or maybe there's not that German beer culture, because. All our beers, all our beer styles, all these things are much older than the idea of Germany or even the country of Germany. So we, okay. we started to exist in 1871. Mm -hmm. So all our beer styles are older than that. Oh. And that's also, if you look in the country today, there's no whole German beer culture. If you go to Bavaria, you have mm -hmm. Helles and Weizen. Mm -hmm. If you go to Franconia, yeah. you have Keller beer. If you go to Berlin, you have the Weisse. Yeah. If, everywhere they drink different beer. Yeah. And, and nowadays, even we have that joke. If you bring a Munich people, a, a Cologne people, and mm -hmm. a Dusseldorf people mm -hmm. on one table, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the Cologne people mm -hmm. orders a Kölsch, and mm -hmm. the Dusseldorf people orders a Ralf beer, yeah. and the Munich people, he said, okay, Water for me, please. Water for me, please. Yes, yeah. and and then then they ask, "What are you doing?" And he says, "Okay, if you don't drink beer, me neither." So <laughs> it's and that yeah. that's the thing. Yeah. So um, I think if I my findings about Danish beer is that there were beers which were from this region, from the people here. I cannot say how far their area was, but like like these wheat oil and skips oil mm -hmm. and yule oil, all these yeah. these nice things yeah. and there are recipes and there mm. are old labels and yeah. and and it were were great beers. So yeah. um, even I have recreated some of them but I also tried some. So that's uh, that's interesting. And I yeah. think maybe the Danish went too fast too far on the lager side mm -hmm. and forgot a bit about their ale history yeah maybe that could be another thing maybe not for you mm -hmm. but for another one mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. to bring that back to denmark yeah. to the, the beer culture <laughs> i tried to um, to uh, make a network uh, with danish brewers we call it new danish beer new dance girl mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and my it was with um, Anders Kismayer, perhaps you know Anders, Anders Kismayer, mm -hmm. and Per Kölster, an ecological uh, organic uh, farmer, and also a hop farmer actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in Denmark? Denmark. Yeah, in Denmark, believe oh. it or not. Um, a little bit farm, mm -hmm. farming. Uh, we made this um, community of, um, of brewers, and we wanted to, my uh, hidden agenda was to try to push in the direction of can this result in a Danish beer style. It didn't hmm. because uh, it has to be terroir based and uh, we have no hops but you can make excellent beers without hops and a uh, lot of beers um, were good with no hops and one of the styles uh, still made today was a was a beer with, um, with the yeasts from the from hay mm -hmm. So uh, the, the beer was spalled, it was uh, wild fermented from these yeasts, no uh, hops added. So uh, that was the closest thing, I, I guess. It, it's a Danish brewery called Herslev Brewery. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a cidery, cider, goose kind of mm -hmm. uh, beer. And he also uh, barrel age, age is age is it. Yes. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I think I think you have the the very old times. If you go back, then you had the area here where cultures clashed in somehow. But, but mm -hmm. not only war, but also yeah. um, you had this honey met 
made meat mm. culture yeah. from the north, and you had the the uh, spicy beers they were making on the British Islands, and mm -hmm. you had what the Romans brought to yeah. Central Europe, yeah. this Egypt-based whatever things. We had the Germanic idea of beer, yeah. and that all came together more or less in northern Germany and also Denmark. Yeah. And so it was always a mixture. And in these times, they also they could not say, "Let's make a." barley beer or wheat mm -hmm. beer or whatever they yeah. they said okay what do we have, what do we have yes. <laughs> or what can we use yeah. and what and then, then they produce something and yeah. and i think a, a, an interesting idea was that especially here as far as i know beer was not only a drink it was something religious yeah. so you wanted to get yeah. drunk to get yeah. closer to yeah. the gods closer mm -hmm. to heaven yeah. You wanted to have this effect and so their goal was also to make quite alcoholic beers which yeah. was different in other mm -hmm. parts so i think there there is some danish ideas in that whole especially thing. for christmas and another of great moments uh, around the year they made uh, strong beers and good beers um, yeah. and they drank a lot and you also uh, must not forget that denmark had its times when they had colonies in the caribbean yeah. they had colonies in india yeah. so yeah. the same as yeah. the british had mm -hmm. so and they had a lot of ships sailing away and yeah. these ships needed something to drink <laughs> And so they also develop beers which could be on the ships and last for a while. So that's not another fake IPA story. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> But it, there are beers made for this. And um, wasn't so it the first time we made we mentioned IPA in this podcast? IPA. I think it was the first time. We shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that. Please skip that. Please. Go yeah, back go and back. Yeah. delete it. Yeah, delete it. No. <laughs> No. Okay, but that, so I think there is a lot of Danish uh, culture in all that, and um, and still, um, what is also interesting, I heard last year about the Icelandic beer culture, um, and they had a lot of um, prohibition there, yeah. and now they restarted, and they also have some beer styles from the time when they were Danish. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe there is also some hidden treasures. Yeah. <laughs> when I make uh, tastings, uh, I, I again and again tell about this. Uh, Danish beer style that we don't have. And then I tell people, the Swedes, they have Gotlands Deutsche, the Finnish have Sati, the Norwegians, ooh, the Norwegians, they have the Quake, Quake. But the Danish, they, I don't think we have any, uh, perhaps the Skipser, uh, Markus. Uh, I think I Skipser, think, definitely. I think, I think you're a better, love, yep. bigger lover for Skipser than I am. Yes. <laughs> yep. As far, I only tried one or two today available things yeah. and i made one myself but in general i like the idea to have a, 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 a about three four percent beer slightly smoky uh, roasty mm -hmm. quite easy drinking yeah. um very nice very refreshing yeah. and this was a beer made for the for the seafarers for the people who went on the ships that that's why the name skips yeah. so but there's also the wheat oil, yeah. which is the yeah. same as in in bavaria It was not not definitely based on wheat. Mm -hmm. Nowadays we we, yeah. we make that the same thing, but in former times it was more about the idea of fermentation and and so on. But I think but it's I think it's also not so important. Um, uh, the the older the the beer nations are, let's say this, the less they care about having own beer styles or not and mm -hmm. uh, and the younger they are for example like in poland the more they want to have some national mm -hmm. beer <laughs> yeah, yeah. but in the end um, beer is not made for that beer is, is made for being drank together yeah. no matter where someone comes from and what nation whatever it's yeah. it's just it's more bringing people together than apart yeah. so um yeah so um, i like being everywhere in the world and trying beer and drinking beer and, yeah. but also there are There is a big importance for people like you, who have a beer style like like Pilsner and and bring it on the on on, on the, the map. map yeah. <laughs> yeah, and also if it just one thing we talked about Karlsberg a mm -hmm. little. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me it's 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 also it has good aspects as it's like this. Um, uh, I try the the English word is maybe foundation, mm -hmm. so yes. that that all the income or. Mo Big part of the yeah, income yeah. goes to social things, yeah. and that they share all the yeah. the things they they have in their scientific mm -hmm. laboratory, mm -hmm. and yeah. and that's a good thing because yeah. that's not only business; yeah. that's also something yeah. for the people, and yeah. that's something that that sets Carlsberg a bit apart from. They others. do, yeah. they do, and they gave their the most famous <coughs> stories. Perhaps they gave away their yeast when they uh, isolated it. Um, in 1883 yeah, yeah 83 yeah, perfect yeah. Uh, yeah 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 um, 
And still up to 20 years ago, people, home brewers, they could come to the gates at the factory in Copenhagen and to have some free uh, yeast. This is a fabulous thing. So, um, salesmen more than brewmasters have dictated uh, the popular beer uh, yeah. in Denmark. And perhaps the Christmas beer is the best example. I, I know no country uh, more than Denmark that celebrates the Christmas beer. Uh, I think there are over 250 <laughs> different varieties of Christmas beer. And uh, you're going to visit Tista mm-hmm. tomorrow, Tista Boykos, um, close to Skagen. And I guess they, I think they make 10 different varieties wow. of Christmas beer. So, of course, it's not because of their, uh, yeah, they love beer, definitely love beer, but they also love making good uh, money, of course. And that's why they make so many Christmas beers in Denmark. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's normally a dark um, buck. But now it has escalated because of the beer revolution to practically any beer that is stark and um, and can go to the Danish uh, food, Christmas food. So the name is Juleøl? Juleøl, yeah. 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 And Jule is uh, Christken, Christ, Christken? Nein. Uh, what, how do you say Christmas in German? Weihnachten. Weihnachten, of course. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Weihnachtsbier. Weihnachtsbier, yeah. I think there's there's one country which is a, a little bit also in that. That's Belgium. Yeah, they have bit, a yes. Christmas beer festival every year, yeah. uh, which I normally attend in in Essen. There's in Essen, an, okay. in a Belgian city yeah. called Essen, yeah. and it's a bit fun because um, it was a small group of maybe ten five local people, yeah. and they started it 15 years ago, something like that. Yeah. And at this time, there were maybe four or five Christmas beers in Belgium. And and then they said, okay, that was a nice evening. We do that now every year and we will have every Belgium Christmas beer. Yeah. And now <laughs> it's more than 400 yeah. and they still keep on that. So they they spend months uh, before yeah. in November, October and drive throughout whole Belgium and get really every Christmas beer that's in Belgium. And mm-hmm. if you are in Essen, you get that. Yeah. Um, that's a, a huge event now. Um, <laughs> where you, it's very rare that you get a ticket and it's, it's a huge thing. And it's still in that little town which, in the middle of nowhere yeah. just because they have started there. And so maybe that's the other country which is also crazy on that. Yeah. Um, but um, maybe in that Jule Öl, is it also... Um, lagers or only ales? Both. Both. Yes. Uh, traditionally, it was lagers because it was uh, a reinvention of the Easter beer, mm-hmm. Danish Easter beer. And the Danish Easter beer from 1905, uh, it was in Carlsberg. They made it in 1905 because of the Paulana Salvato. Mm. Uh, the Paulana Salvato in several years in Denmark, especially Copenhagen, was so popular that they had Salvato days celebrating um, uh, Easter with this Paulana Salvato beer. Mm. And of course, uh, Carlsberg, at that time, they made fabulous beers, but they made also want to make money. And they had a keen look on this Salvato days, and they said to themselves, let's make a Salvato beer. So they made a Salvato-like beer, uh, Easter beer. And that's how the tradition of Easter beers and Christmas beers started. That's Denmark. fun. Yeah. That's interesting, because if you look back in the history, um, we had this special beers, of course, also because of the Einbeck story and all that, but the Christianity took it over and had these beers in these days where you were not allowed to eat before Christmas and before Easter. So these were it's the two yeah. Yeah. big Bock beer seasons now in Germany. Yeah. And... In Germany, they all forgot that there is an Easter book. They now say it's a My book. My book, yeah. But it, it, traditionally, it was also Easter. It turned into My because it's more Easter. Easter changes yeah. every year, yeah. and sometimes it's so early that it's not spring, yeah. and they associate this book more with springtime, yeah. and so yeah. it got My book. But originally, it's yeah. also this Easter beer. So, and, and even Salvato is one of these. Yeah. But I think if you ask. 100 German beer drinkers, 99.9% yeah. yeah. of them will, will never know that the Salvator tradition goes back to yeah. that historical yes. Easter beer. So maybe the Danish preserved it longer than the Germans did. Yeah. I love all kinds of beers. <laughs> they, just as they are, if they are good. Yeah. Um, and 
not uh, surprisingly, I'm in, especially <coughs> in love with the lager beers. And these days, Bock beers are my makes my heart uh, weak. You know, what do you mm. say? <laughs> um, but uh, Bock beers is not that popular uh, in Denmark. Uh, we are, have been uh, in the center of the beer revolution in uh, in Europe. It was the first country that took over the new waves of uh, the American beer revolution. And uh, the mantra, the, um, the theme was anything goes. But actually it was the India Pale Ale and India, India Pale um, thinking uh, that took over the market. And today, and I have spoken to several um, of my uh, of brewmasters in, in, in Denmark, we're not that fond of how it has developed. Yeah. Because uh, up to 50% of craft beer bars is uh, uh, India Pale Ales, and uh, especially the New England India Pale Ales. Um, now you said the bad words. Oh, I said the bad words. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Um, I think we have to say the bad words, because yes. uh, I'm into... My love is founded because of the variety of beer. Um, and And I think sometimes I don't think there's that much variety if, when you come to a, a hipster bar or a craft beer bar or whatever you call it and i think it's a shame yeah but i i also think it's now going another direction slowly but it is and also because i think maybe 10 years ago people associated beer variety with hops so they didn't think that you have a big variety of malts, for example. So many people I was I was uh, meeting in the states, so they didn't even know that there is dark beer. Mm. So um, th that is uh, something yeah. uncommon. Also with the yeast that you can experiment with the yeast yeah. and make several fermentations, whatever. That's also something new, yeah. and also more and more new raw materials and 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 other things you can yeah. use for beers come on the market. And as we tasted today, we were just having a nice lunch here in the local brewery, and we we drank two beers, mm -hmm. but one of them was made with um, like citrusy and elderflower, yeah, elderflower aroma, and, and the other one, or, or real stuff, yeah. and the other one was made with cherries, cherries and yeah. sugar. Yeah. So, so we see, and they were both at two and a half percent. So I think if you look a little bit back, it's interesting because normally we would have expected you drink the Pilsner and I drink maybe the Munich Dunkel. Yeah. <laughs> but you see, even we change. Yeah, yeah. So, And I think um, that, that is something that changes. And I think it's it's a bit also a marketing thing because at the moment that, that you also realize it's still so, if you make a new beer and you write it something IPA, mm -hmm. it sells much better it than if you... Better. That's how you, we have a cold IPA yeah, yeah, and all yeah. these things, um, yeah. which are more or less just other beer styles. But yeah. if you uh, call them somehow IPA, people like that. Yeah. But I think it's 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 getting less. Okay. But, but if we talk about that, what is the... You said Denmark was the first country to adopt this mm -hmm. American craft beer yeah. thing. How did you... Realize that so because you were in the, in the in the pills culture and you had your nice pale lagers and yeah. and then someone popped in and gave you something different or how did, did it work? I am interested in every beer styles just as long as they are good. Uh, so um, and I've traveled to Germany and Belgium, uh, of course, to um, or and uh, England also, um, Czech Republic, uh, great beer nations, but. Normally, I was based at home in Copenhagen um, for many years, and uh, we had a couple of uh, twins. Well, we had some twins, and these two twins, you can't underestimate their um, uh, importance to the beer culture in Denmark and perhaps to the beer culture in, in Europe uh, in the beginning of the beer revolution. It was Mikkel Borg Bjausø with his brand Mikella mm -hmm. and his twin brother, Jeppe. Biausu, I think he's called. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they sometimes change names. Mm. <laughs> um, Miguel was a brewer, and Jeppe, he imported beers. And he was the first main importer of American craft beer, and, and called Dreckeride. Dreckeride. And um, this import uh, firm, you can't underestimate it, they took the very best, or what he thought was the very best. There was no competition. Hmm. So he sold it to all the um, um, all the good beer bars in Denmark and, and other places in, uh, in Europe. 
and they somehow pushed uh, the limits for what is beer, what is good beer uh, in, in Denmark, and they attracted a lot of followers, a um, lot of um, people who brewmasters who like to behave or brew like them. Uh, and they were they were very charismatic types and very influential types still today. There's a long story about the McKellar brand. Yeah, we can take it another time, Marcus. <laughs> I, would, I would love it. Just just one question: Is it still today that Mikkel has this no. special position? He was the godfather of craft beer in the first years. Uh, today, no longer. Hmm. Okay, we will. We will talk that in another. Yeah, we will episode. take it along. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's a, there's yeah. a book on that and, and other things. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. Hmm. But and and today, what is Danish craft beer today? I think it's a little bit standstill. There's 260 different, uh, 260 uh, breweries all over Denmark, from the tip of uh, Denmark to yeah, to the bottom of them, <laughs> all over. Uh, but there's not that much um, uh, evolution or uh, revolution in the beer market these days. It's, it's more non-alcoholic beers. Uh, it's more. Um, Big, uh, big selling uh, types of beer. Um, the development is not that interesting. There's still good breweries, but but not many, I think, if I may be so blunt. Um, we have good breweries, but indeed we have good breweries. But somehow um, this is a standstill. Hmm. And what about home brewing in Denmark? Is it also home growing brewing. or? It's growing, I think. Uh, I think it's uh, 15,000 brewers, uh, home brewers, many home brewers, and very, very uh, clever, uh, good home brewers. That's, that's uh, thriving, that, that thing is thriving. But the market is uh, difficult because the big brewers, they are buying small brands, they are making sub brands, they are making. Uh, good agreements with the big supermarket chains and so on. Um, the, the many, the 260 brewers in Denmark had great difficulties to 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 make a hole into the market, penetrate the market. Um, and I don't see any light uh, coming mm. out there. Because perhaps the web shops, but yeah. Mm. Uh, every brewery today has, a, well, most breweries, they have own web shops, but I don't think it can change the market significantly. Mm. Sorry. Is there a lot of competition, or or, or are they also working together on some things? No, competition. Competition. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's sharp. There's, the knives are sharpening out there. Mm. Old buddies are are now um, competitors. Um, yeah, it's a totally different market from just five years ago. Five years ago, I think it was more interesting. Mm. And for you, as a beer writer, did that also change your work? Do you now write differently or different stories? Or I don't know. Perhaps. I don't perhaps. know. I don't know. Um, perhaps more stories about the market, because that's where, that's where quality can, uh, can, can make a big step forward. If the market changes towards quality, the whole beer... Uh, uh, category is uh, more interesting. So, if you want to change quality, go for the big markets. Go for the supermarket chains, supermarkets, mm. yeah. importers. That's that's where we can make a significant um, differences for the better. Yeah, that's maybe something. Also, German people know Danish beer people because the biggest importer for beer in Germany is a Danish company called mm. One Pint. Yes. And um, maybe that's also something, especially Danish people are good about, is uh, trading and trading. trading with beer, yeah. and that's something maybe that's still connected. The good salesman, good trading, trading salesman. Uh, the Christmas beers uh, is a, good, <laughs> it's a very good example. The one pint is also well a good example. Good, good uh, trading uh, people. Yeah. yeah, and you have another book project in the pipeline. Yes, and I'm looking forward to write the book about the Danish beer revolution. Ha. Aha! The best beers, so the best More breweries. than five pages, yes? More than five pages. Uh, good stories. Um, yeah, that's in my pipeline. Perhaps next year. Okay. Yeah. And maybe also in English sometimes. So. Perhaps in English. I hope so. Then yeah. it, that will be an achievement. Danish beer in English, about Danish. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, there is beer. there is some books in English about Danish beer. So um, I I bought the book about the historic Danish beer style. Okay. So I can only yeah. recommend also the listeners yeah. if you are interested. There's a lot of also about some history parts, but not in that global way. I think you will cover. No. So I'm looking forward to have that and mm -hmm. read that. So yeah. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks a lot for the information. My pleasure, Good luck. <laughs> Markus. Mark, my pleasure. And nice to have you here in Skane. Yeah, fantastic. It's a great place. I also only can recommend um, come to the top of Denmark and have a nice beer here. Maybe meet Christian and um, enjoy it. It's a wonderful place. Thank you. Beer Talk, der Podcast rund ums Bier. Alle Folgen unter www.beertalk.de.